I'm a, excuse me. I'm going to call to order the presentation tonight from the Kern, Count, uh, Kern Cog Public Workshop, Proterra Zero Emission All Electric Buses. Mr. Lee Wixon is here to speak yes. with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, board members. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening. I appreciate it, uh, this opportunity to come and tell you a little bit about Proterra Electric Buses. So uh, if you have any questions uh, along the way, let me know. We've tried to reserve a little bit of time at the end to answer those should you have any, okay? We'll start off to just tell you a little bit about the history of, of uh, Proterra. It was uh, founded in 2004, originally started in Golden, Colorado, uh, and then uh, moved offices back to Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, we currently have a manufacturing facility um, in Greenville, South Carolina, and additionally uh, of recent, we have just secured a factory uh, in LA County. Uh, so we're gonna be opening a, a new facility down in City of Industry. Uh, so that'll be opening up uh, pr probably mid-year 2016. Additionally, we just opened uh, new corporate headquarters in Burlingame, California. Um, so that's our new corporate headquarters. Many of our uh, uh, folks from our corporate headquarters uh, previously back in Greenville, South Carolina are relocating out to California into the Bay Area. So uh, we really have a, a much deeper presence in the state of California out here now. So we've added some new facilities. We have about 200 employees currently. Obviously that's going to ramp up uh, pretty rapidly as we start the new production line in, uh, in Southern uh, California. So uh, later in the year we'll be bringing some new jobs to uh, Southern California as well. Um, our backing on the uh, the company, um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, and really the important thing I think is we talk about our executive team. Um, again, a couple hundred employees, but what's really important I think is who's guiding the ship. Our present CEO is Ryan Popple, and Ryan's background, uh, he comes from Tesla. Um, so uh, he has a de some deep roots up in the Bay Area and tied to the Tesla organization. He was one of the top financial people within Tesla when they started the company and uh, led them uh, through their uh, public offering. So uh, he brings a lot of experience uh, to us from uh, electric battery and vehicle technology. So really excited to have him as our leader. Um, talking a little bit about uh, our, the investors in our company, I think that's important as well as who's behind us. Kleiner Perkins, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, in the Bay Area, huge investors in companies uh, like uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and those. They're the, the lead investor in our company as well um, and uh, really stand behind us, have been from the beginning, and uh, really are leading edge technology type people and, uh, and just a great fit for us. Additionally, a couple of other mentions, I think, in that category as well. General Motors Ventures is on our board and investor in our company as well. Um, the folks that uh, are currently building the Volt and the Bolt um, are, are, are very uh, uh, in, involved with our company as well from a technology sharing standpoint also as we continue to move forward. And two other notables in there, I think, is Southern California Edison and Constellation Energy uh, are on our board uh, as well. Uh, we uh, get a lot of good feedback from them as we continue to move electric vehicles forward uh, across the country. Um, switching gears, going over to kind of who is, who's our existing base. We currently have 15 customers uh, with buses in service. Uh, we have 110 firm motors in our pipeline currently today, and uh, we have 316 uh, uh, contracted options sitting in reserve. Uh, our most recent customer just came on was King County Metro up in Seattle. Um, they currently have five buses being built with options for 200 uh, additional. Um, a, a, and another mention on there is the University of Montana, our first university. Um, there will be a, a, a press release coming out uh, actually next week announcing the fact that they're going to be converting their entire fleet over to Proterra electric buses on the campus. So it's a really great fit up there. Additionally, the local transit there, Mountain Line Transit, uh, will be working with them. They're sharing a transit station downtown and both intend on fully electrifying up there. So some neat things happening there. Tell you a little bit about our mission. Um, you know, what was our objective? Clean, quiet transportation for all really was the focus of us as we started. And I'll kind of touch on a few of the pieces of that. The economics, the best total cost of ownership certainly was our mission. Operating costs and the least volatility were really important to us. From a performance standpoint, the highest miles per gallon equivalency, lowest weight, and most torque. Um, we certainly want a bus that can be out on the front line and, and do the service that any bus can do out there, and we've achieved that. Customer preferences, that it's a clean vehicle, that it's quiet, safe, and modern, were some of the things that we considered as we developed our product. I'll touch more, uh, uh, more on that as we go through some of the unique characteristics of that. Policy and regulation, local health, air quality, and climate change were at the very top as well, and certainly things that were considered as we developed our bus. <clears throat> go back. 
back. I'm sorry about that. Right there. This page uh, really uh, pretty critical. And this gives us really four different buckets to take a look at. I want to start off first over to the far uh, left-hand side as you look at tailpipe emissions. This is the clean side of it. If you look across the bottom of it, you'll see a D, that's for diesel, diesel H, diesel hybrid, CNG, and Proterra. And we can touch on that on each of the four categories as we go across. As you can see, obviously, Proterra is all electric. It has no, no tailpipe emissions. But it will give you the comparison to the others in diesel, hybrid, and CNG. The quiet side of it really important and this is a real add I think to electric vehicles that isn't considered all that much as we continue to grow out into the neighborhoods into the downtown communities it's it's really important and this factor has really raised up uh, uh, the quiet side of it as the buses are running out there early in mornings late at night uh, having a vehicle that generates almost no noise is really beneficial the, you're looking at decibels there uh, our bus runs at uh, a little under 60 decibels uh, decibels aren't linear so uh, you know just think about it it's really kind of the sound of tires going across the road is is the noise that you hear from our bus um, so it's it's really nice and and there's been some huge benefits in the in the community from that the next category over from an efficiency standpoint um, if you look uh, these are averages provided to us by APTA uh, diesel they show a four miles per gallon diesel hybrid five CNG three and in our case Proterra we have a 23 miles per gallon equivalency rate um, with our bus um, you know that's better than most uh, SUVs out there and we have a 40 foot vehicle so you know it, it, it's really efficient and gets very very good mileage and, and certainly as you look at it from a comparison to the other products way better better okay last category over lifetime fuel costs this is a critical one if you look at that you, again um, if you look at Proterra there's eighty one thousand dollars over the lifetime of the bus that's the electric cost to charge this bus up over its lifetime there's huge savings in this bucket from a uh, from a, a fuel cost standpoint and a maintenance standpoint which I'll touch on again here in a minute um, next category to talk about here is total cost of ownership and this is really how it all tallies out. I'm pretty sure probably everybody in the room realizes that electric vehicles have been a little more expensive up front because of the, where the technology is today. So the critical piece to it is, is how does it fare out as you look at it over its lifetime. So if you'll take a look up there, you'll see vehicle costs. And uh, the uh, Proterra, $749,000 cost there. The CNG bus at four seventy. dollars diesel bus at 454 and hybrid at 650 and again these aren't our numbers they were provided to us by APTA um, energy and fuel if you follow that line across you'll see how much is spent over a 12-year lifetime in each of those categories and then again the line below that is the maintenance costs but if you look at the total cost of ownership including the vehicle um, fuel and maintenance over its lifetime you'll see that uh, a Proterra is less even though you pay more for it up front over its lifetime you have savings there and if you look at the line below it, you'll see TCO dollars per mile. And that's something that is tracked in the industry. And as you'll see out there, we're at $2.47 a mile, and really the least, once again, when you look at it uh, uh, across the board. If you look at the graph off to the right-hand side, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, the green one being Proterra, the cost of the vehicle up front is more. But when you look at fuel and maintenance costs over its lifetime, it brings it down to be less than the other vehicles. Okay. Additionally, a couple uh, notables down at the bottom down there, 30% fewer parts. This, this bus is simpler. It has a lot less parts than a traditional engine vehicle out there. So uh, there's a lot less maintenance and repair that's required on it over its lifetime and really a simplified, easier to work on vehicle. And then lastly, electric prices. When you look at um, fuel costs, be that diesel or CNG, they're unpredictable, up and down a lot. And you look at the lifetime of electric, and it's much more stable, easier to predict for transit agencies as they budget for it and those types of things. So uh, much more reliable from that standpoint. Okay, next I want to uh, touch here now on the, uh, the economics of improving rapidly. And uh, two different things. As you look off to the left side of this, that's U.S. vehicle sales in, uh, uh, over the life. If you look from 2010 up to 2015, how they've grown. What we're really about to see coming up in the next couple of years is a huge spike here. As you look at General Motors and you look at Tesla, both coming out with vehicles that are going to be in about the $35,000 price range, you're going to see a really huge spike coming up very soon on this. Um, Moving over to the right-hand column, lithium-ion uh, battery costs, this is based on a kilowatt hour is how this is looked at. If you look back to 2009, it was $1,200 for a kilowatt hour of energy. 
If you look at it now in 2015, it's at $300. This is what allowed our buses to go from $1.3 million down to $749,000. And that'll keep coming down a little bit. We still have some, some ground to make up there. Um, one of the things of recent, of, a, a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to go to Reno, Nevada. Um, outside of Reno in Sparks, there's a new uh, Tesla's building. It's a gigafactory up there with Panasonic. Um, it's amazing. When you look at it, they'll have the ability to build battery packs for 500,000 vehicles, which right now is larger than the overall batteries required right now around the world. So they're building this huge, huge facility up there. As it stands today, it's probably the second largest building in the United States, and we'll have massive ability to build uh, vehicle batteries out of it. So it, it, it's really interesting and exciting to see that type of commitment uh, from Panasonic, from Tesla, and from others within the industry to continue to develop not only develop batteries to make them more efficient, to, but to make them more affordable and continue to drive the costs of the, of the buses down over time. So um, that's really exciting news for us. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is different by design. As you look at this, you know, we selected battery electric. We felt that that was the choice. The, the thing about us is that we designed a clean sheet vehicle. Um, our, our bus isn't a, it wasn't a CNG bus, it wasn't a diesel bus. We had a chance to start with a clean sheet of paper and make an electric bus. And that was our choice. It was our choice not to, uh, to, to do some other type of hybrid bus or something like that. We believe full electric is the end result. Um, so we, we went down that road. Clean sheet design, I'm going to be touching on that in the next slide or two coming up to explain more of that. Core innovations, uh, drivetrain and charging technologies are very advanced, partnering with the world's best technology providers, LG Kim, Panasonic, Tesla. Many of those are our partners and involved with on our board. So really exciting things to be working with what are truly the world leaders in electric vehicle technology. Okay. Outcome, three generations of vehicles. Uh, you know, we're, we're on a new generation right now. Every time we do it, they're, they're, they're more advanced, they're more efficient. So what, we're really enjoying some good growth with that. Strongest intellectual property, because we did build just an electric bus, it's not something else. We have a lot of intellectual property that is, that is really uh, important to the success of our product. Record-breaking performance, uh, FTA required Altoona testing. If you look at the next line down, we've demonstrated in two different cases that um, uh, 250 miles between charges on our extended range bus, and those numbers will likely continue to go up in the future. And then the next one over, and I'll talk more about these, is our fast charge bus, which it, it hits a charger uh, as it circulates uh, around the town picking people up. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It doesn't need to stop, but in 24 hours, it did over 700 miles, okay? So next, I'm going to talk about kind of what is different by design, you know, uh, on our product. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the highest performance part of it, the TerraFlex energy system, our charging options, and then some of the other services. Also, to let you know, we currently offer a 35-foot bus and a 40-foot bus and certainly have others on our, on our scope in the future. But currently, right now, we're staying focused on those two. Okay? Next thing, the Catalyst platform, um, the lightest transit vehicle on the market. Uh, allowed us to get some increased capacity within the bus. Our 40-foot vehicle can seat up to 77 passengers seated in standing. Our 35 is up to 60 passengers. Lowest rear axle weight in the industry because we don't have a big, huge engine sitting back there in the back of the bus. So it's really allowed us to be lighter, which is, and I'm talking in the neighborhood of 5,000 pounds lighter than a traditional bus, which is, is really hopefully going to be nice on the roads and the cities will, I think, appreciate less damage to the roadways out there. Down to the left hand, it, towards the bottom, uh, most efficient in its class. Uh, at our testing at Altoona, our bus was 15% more efficient than any other in the industry. And again, because we started with a clean sheet, we're able to design the most efficient bus out there. Longest range per kilowatt hour of energy, lowest fuel cost at 1.7 kilowatt hours per mile is what it uses. The highest uh, durable for greatest safety. Um, our, our product is an advanced carbon fiber composite vehicle and it's the only one out there like this. So it's fiberglass, but also carbon fiber. It's incredibly strong, incredibly safe, allows us to be lighter out there. When you have an electric vehicle and you're using electric energy to move it around to pick people up, carrying extra weight isn't a good thing. So the more efficient we can make it, the lighter we can make it, the better, because we can get more and more range out of it. So those are things that we really focused on heavily. Um, also non-conductive and uh, rust resistant are some other benefits that come along with that. 
The next slide is now I want to talk to you a little bit about the product itself and what makes our product so, so unique. Two different things. You're looking at the underside of our bus. It was designed to have eight compartments on the underside of it. This is where the battery packs go. There are no battery packs inside the bus or on the roof of the bus. They were designed to go under the bus where we believe they're the safest. However, what we've been able to do is create two different, two different battery designations. It's one platform, one bus. However, a, a transit agency has a choice. They can have a extended range bus that charges up at the shop at the depot and goes out and spends a day doing its course or they can go with a fast charge bus. That fast charge bus will have an overhead charger on it that it comes to each time it stops to pick people up. It's charging. I'm going to touch more on that in just a minute. One of the really wonderful benefits about this is that if a transit agency were to purchase, let's say, fast charge buses up front, over the course of its 12 years, it, the, the routes change, things change. They would have the ability to cross over the batteries. What I mean by that is if they bought a fast charge bus, but over time they found our routes have changed, we need an extended range bus. Literally, you change out the battery packs, you do some programming, and this bus can be used as an extended range bus or a fast charge bus. Additionally, both buses can be charged with either charger, a slow charger or overhead fast charger. I'll touch more on that in just a minute. We use two different types of uh, uh, chemistry on the batteries. If you look down below, lithium titanate oxide is what's used on our fast charge. Nickel manganese cobalt oxide is what's used on our extended range. Next, I'll talk about the, the charging side of it. This slide shows you, and I'll kind of walk through the different charging options that you have. The on-route overhead charger, uh, you'll look at, there's the hood over the top of the bus. That's the charger itself, okay? Um, so th th as the bus pulls up to that charger, um, it, it, it positions itself. They drive up to it, the computer takes over, moves the bus into position, and it clamps on. This is conductive charging. So there's a, a clamp that clamps onto a charging fin on the top. That happens within about 20 seconds. From there, this bus, depending upon how long a route it just went on, will recharge itself back to 95% state of charge in three to four to five minutes. And it can literally go 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just keep driving as long as it comes back to that charger every time. So it's kind of an endless route, quite honestly. It doesn't need to go back to the transit uh, facility for any kind of maintenance or any fuel or anything like that because it's getting it. People are getting on and off of the bus while it's charging. They don't even know it's happening. Okay, Foothill Transit was one of our first customers down in Los Angeles. They're our largest. We have many, many videos of them. Stockton, as well, is one of our customers, Reno RTC. And, and, and people don't realize that this is taking place while they're getting on and off. So it's really, really nice that it's refueling itself. Nobody knows about it, and it seamlessly continues and keeps on going. So the next one down towards the bottom of the page, you'll see a depot charger port. On the, uh, on the door side there, there's actually two ports where you can plug chargers in. It uses an industry standard. It's called a J1772 CCS charge adapter. This is the most standardized ad adapter that's available in the marketplace today for electric vehicles. This will likely be used on a majority of electric cars or other vehicles that might be used within a transit agency so they don't have to buy multiple chargers. Uh, this is the most standardized out there that you can get at this time, and I think everybody's heading in that direction. Okay, so depot charger. Another thing that we're looking at is wireless technology to where it would charge underneath the bus. Um, that technology is out there a little, but it's, it, it's really not developed to a point to where it's ready for use on our bus because it's a very small charger. It doesn't provide a lot of charging back to it to give us the additional range. Okay. And uh, this, I just put this slide in uh, towards the end. This is actually King County Metro. Uh, this is the, one of the most recent uh, uh, facilities that we set up with an overhead fast charger. You'll see how they've tied the charger in, the graphics on the bus, and the overhead charger. Um, you have, uh, uh, many of them are doing contests now within the city to let people name the routes, name the buses, do the graphics packages, and a lot of those things to get community involvement as well. Okay. 
the next slide that I have here is one of the first steps that I take to, you know, it's one thing for me to get up here and talk about this. It's another thing for me to show you how the bus would perform on your routes. I have a GPS app on my phone that allows me to hop on a bus and ride your routes. It will record that route. It does a track on it. I submit that to our factory. It goes through a computer analysis, and it will compare it based off of the data that that transit agency gives us on how their other buses perform on it, miles per gallon, fuel used, miles, elevation changes, all those things. And from that, I can provide this report to a transit agency for them to show and speak with their boards to help them understand the, some of the savings that come along with that, how the bus will perform on it, and also provide a total cost of ownership analysis for them to help them explain. And then uh, this is uh, pretty much the last slide that we're coming up here to now. Some of the price points, you heard me talk about $749,000. Um, that's, that's your typical bus for us. We do have some other options out there, however, because not all of them need to have eight battery packs. If they're shorter routes, they might be able to come in with four packs or six packs and reduce the cost down to $549 or $599, depending. Additionally, we now offer an option for uh, transit agencies as well that they can procure the bus and lease the battery pack. Um, at that point, it becomes our liability for those battery packs over the 12 years of the vehicle. So they can, and not only that, many of them have funds out there. Their funds come in to use for maintenance and for fuel. So they have funds there already to purchase uh, diesel fuel or CNG or whatever it is. They can consider using those funds as a monthly payment to pay for the batteries so they don't have the upfront cost that it would take to purchase the bus with the batteries. Okay. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to come and, and visit with all of you guys. I'll gladly try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Wixom. Do, does anyone up here have any questions or folks in the audience? Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I met some of your uh, representatives when I was at the APTA meeting in San Francisco. It was the first time I had been exposed to these type of buses, but I, I think you've answered a lot of my questions were we have, our routes are very far apart. I mean, uh, they go from one end of the city to the other. So my concerns were the, the charging. Um, do the, uh, the charging systems, are they the same from other, at, at other companies or is it it's usually? Uh, it, that's a really good question. Uh -huh. Now again, when we talk about the 50 kilowatt sharp charger that would be back at their facility, again, ours is the most standardized that's out there and other manufacturers are using that. So that one for sure. Our overhead charger that you saw, um, there's really only ourselves and one other manufacturer that's doing any on-route overhead charging at this point. And, and we were many years out in front of most of these people. So our, our particular overhead charger that we use there is 500 kilowatts. It's, it's a very heavy duty charger. Um, we are currently working with uh, all of the other transit manufacturers right now trying to, to, to uh, standardize charging. We, I think we're there for the most part on the sh uh, shop charger. The overhead charger is still one that we're trying to develop with some of the others and come up with a charger that can be used with multiple brands of electric buses. So we're working on that and trying to get cooperation from all the other manufacturers as well for standardization. Okay, thank you. You're That's welcome. Right. Anyone else maybe in the public have a have question? A couple yes, of sir. Questions. Uh, what uh, voltage on those batteries uh, do they run? Pardon me? The voltage. On the, the voltage. Um, well, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily voltage. You have, you have batteries on the bus that are 24-volt batteries that run all of the internal things. Um, the batteries underneath the bus is a group of batteries, and they're all basically put in series. So when you put all those together, you generate what is called kilowatt hours worth of batteries. Example, on the fast charge bus, it has 105 kilowatts of energy. On that, on that bus. And we know that it uses about 1.7 kilowatts per mile. Mm -hmm. So it's really a different calculation. It becomes a group calculation of how much energy you have, and then it determines how much energy does it take to move it per mile. On our extended range buses, that ranges from 250 and may even go up to 400 kilowatts. And again, remember you charge that one at night, which gives you much longer range on it. So two different things, but they're measured differently now in kilowatt hours. Are they uh, maintenance free? Um, yeah, they, they, they really are maintenance free. They're completely sealed. They're underneath the bus. And actually the battery packs are sealed up and nobody should be in those other than the manufacturer. It's not like you want the transit agency o opening up battery packs. So uh, all, if, if, if there was ever a problem and, and we've had none, 
a whole pack would be lowered out, put a battery pack in, we would take it to the factory and find out why a cell went bad or whatever the case. Oh, thank you. There, I believe that your presentation is amazing. I thank you. See those uh, buzzes. Thank you. I yeah, at some I point in time in the future, I'll try to plan one. a demonstration trip That's through cool. here and be uh, gl uh, gladly try to show up here when you guys are all here so you can have a look at it. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you very, very much for that presentation and coming out welcome. tonight. Thank very you. good. Thank, Thank you, you for sir. The opportunity. Okay, at this time, then we'll take a little break uh, until 6.30 to let everyone get settled. Thank you. I'd like to call to order the Kern Council of Governments Transportation Planning and Policy Committee meeting on Thursday, January 21st, 2016 at 6.30 p.m. At this time, would everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance that will be led tonight by Councilman Phil Smith. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before we ask for a roll call, I'd like to introduce Councilman Mike Maurer from Ridgecrest, who's now joining us, and he will be our regular representa representation from uh, Ridgecrest. And also welcome con uh, Congressman Thomas for being here tonight as well. At this time, roll call, pl please. Here. 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 Thank you very much. At this time, we'll take public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may briefly, uh, may respond briefly to statements made or questions posted. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Seeing no one approach, we'll move to the consent calendar. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by current Council of Government staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion by, is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Anyone in the public or on up here that have any questions concerning the consent calendar for this? <coughs> Seeing none, roll call vote. I mean, uh, make a motion for approval. Okay. I'm requesting a motion for approval of the consent calendar with the addendum on the addition of item 4.0. <coughs> so moved. Second. 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 Roll call. Thank you. Yes. Boxer. Yes. Boxer. Yes. Boxer. Yes. Yes. Wigman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scribner? Aye. Miller? Yes. Tara? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, moving on to item 5, 2015 Federal Transportation Improvement Program, FTIP, Amendment Number 15. Mr. Pacheco? Oh, Mr. Pacheco. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. An amendment has been processed that includes revisions to the Safety Program, Regional Service Transportation Program, Transit Program, and Non-Motorized Program. The amendment documentation is available on the Kern Cog website. The public review period began <laughs> on January 8th and ends on January 22nd. One correction is needed for the non-motorized program project to make it consistent with the active transportation program project list that was approved at today's California Transportation Commission meeting. The correction will be submitted as part of the summary of comments for the amendment. 
The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on January 25th. State and federal approval is required. And at this time, I ask that the chair please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Thank you, ma'am. At this time, I'll open uh, the public hearing. Anyone have any comments? Seeing none, uh, move to close the public hearing. Or we just close it. Closing the public hearing. And that's it. Next one. Next one <laughs> is uh, six project delivery policy letter, ATP, CMAC, RSTP, and transit. Again. The Kern Cog project delivery policy states that projects in the current fiscal year need to be submitted for funding authorization by January 31st. If the agencies plan to submit projects for funding authorization beyond January 31st, lead agencies are asked to submit a letter with a revised submittal schedule. And those letters this year were due on January 15th. So as part of your folders today, you have a revised project list and the letters received to date um, are provided, like I said, in your folders. And this item is for information. Yes, thank you very much. Anyone have any questions, however, on this item? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Moving to item number seven, 2016 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, RTIP, Mr. Stromalia. Thank you, Madam Chair and Directors. Um, this item this evening is going to include a speaker and presentation, Mr. Stephen Keck. Uh, from Caltrans is going to help us out. Um, I would like to give a, a presentation, uh, though, to lead up to his um, uh, uh, presentation and to discuss why we're still talking about the 2016 Regional Transportation Improvement Program. Today, the California Transportation Commission approved a negative revised 2016 fund estimate for revenue that finances uh, capacity increasing transportation projects of regional significance. New funding for the next five years is non-existent and programming in the current 2014 state transportation improvement program will have to be reduced by approximately $750 million statewide. So rather than it just being a respreading or a deferral zero-sum game, now we're having to pull projects. Our, re our, our therefore our regionally adopted 2016 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, Capital Improvement Program, will be revisited in the month of February, and this board will be asked to approve a revised Capital Improvement Program in which projects that are not yet delivered are deleted from the current 2014 State Transportation Improvement Program. Kern Cog staff uh, recommendation. The Kern-Cox staff recommendation in February will be consistent with the established regional priorities that are a part of that list that was uh, presented to you. Uh, based on the estimated deprogramming need of $750 million statewide, uh, it is expected that Kern-Cog will be asked to deprogram at least $15 million. That's just the basic math we do to estimate our county share. It's about 2%. Does it mean it will be exactly that? Um, plus or minus based on the status of the project and the priorities adopted by the Commission. So Commission staff will do the work, we will review it and decide if we agree with it or not. Um, and so based on our region's priorities and the state's inability to finance the 2016 State Transportation Improvement Program, we expect to see a deprogramming of at least two projects. Uh, including US 395 Elantra Cartago, which is our partnership project, our neighbors to the north, uh, as well as which we've we have some uh, step funding on, as well as Freeman Gulch, also ready for construction, uh, segment one. And when I add up the Kern Cog portion of those two projects, uh, it's about $22 million. Remaining the remaining two projects on our capital improvement program, including State Route 58 Centennial Corridor and State Route 46, could be and are likely to be subject to additional delay and future deprogramming should the state transportation improvement program continue to be void of a revenue stream. There is not enough revenue to deliver projects even now in this federal fiscal or the state fiscal year, excuse me, uh, into next year. Uh, Stephen 
will be helping us understand why that is. Uh, and so to conclude uh, my presentation here, while the current circumstances surrounding the 2016 RTIP process suggests that a portion of our program is at risk, the reality is that our entire program is at risk of being lost, including $300 million plus dollars associated with those STIP dollars um, that are slated to be invested uh, with those state uh, dollars to deliver all of these projects. And so this is not a happy report, I'm sorry. Um, the small table I've given you, um, uh, I pretty much, it's in your folders, just this small presentation tonight. Uh, so it's all in there. Um, and so with that, uh, Mr. Stephen Keck, uh, he's with the Department of Finance, is that correct or no? <laughs> Kill me now? No. <laughs> well, I know he's with Caltrans. Okay. Cal so Does <laughs> Board members, you, uh, Stephen's presentation is also in your folder if, if, you, if yeah, you find it easier to follow yeah. along with the paper yeah. copy. So thank and you. by the way, thank you for traveling here for this oh, presentation. Absolutely. Tonight. Thank you. So uh, my name is Stephen Keck, as, as Joe indicated. I am the chief budget officer for uh, Caltrans, and I have been for about eight years now. I've uh, been with Caltrans for 15 years, and transportation revenues are my game. This is really what I do, um, which right now makes me a very unpopular person most places I go, because unfortunately the message that I have isn't a very rosy one. And uh, with your indulgence, I'm going to explain a little bit about how we got to where we are today and why uh, in, in, uh, in Joe's presentation we talked about having to deprogram projects. So first, uh, let me talk about the big picture in terms of transportation funding. Uh, there is, without a doubt, a shortfall in transportation funding across the board. Um, the California Transportation Commission uh, issued a report in 2011 that identified unfunded needs of $300 billion across all modes of, of travel and across all levels of government. This is local government, state government, um, including federal highways as well. Uh, it does not include any high-speed rail numbers in it, but this is a shortfall of $300 billion across all modes of travel across the state. Uh, earlier, well, I guess it would have been last year now, the governor um, issued a release where he talked about a $57 billion shortfall just on state highway rehabilitation projects. $57 billion over 10 years. And in early uh, 2015, uh, local streets and roads um, were also assessed. This is the Margo Yip presentation that many of you have probably seen before uh, that assessed local transportation needs shortfalls of about $78 billion over 10 years. So, um, you know, I think the CTC is an overarching number. We're looking at a very big number. I, I sometimes, or not sometimes, but have recently categorized this as 200 Powerball jackpots. That's how much is needed to fund the shortfall of transportation funding. So when we talk about transportation funding, and I do apologize, those of you who are looking at, at this on the screen will be unable to see any of the tiny print on there. Hopefully your printouts uh, will be more readable. But when we talk about how we fund transportation projects, it comes down to the tax structure on gasoline. So we have, when we go and buy gasoline at the pump, we have four general taxes that we pay at the pump. We have a base excise tax on gasoline, something the state has been charging since 1923. That is the sole state source for maintenance of the highway system. It's also shared with locals for maintenance and upkeep of local streets and roads. We have a horribly named price base excise tax, which I'm going to explain a little bit later. That is the fund source for the STIP. So when we're talking later about why the STIP funding went away, this is what that fund source is, this price based excise tax. It was put in place in 2010, replacing the sales tax we used to pay on gasoline. Um, and we'll talk more about how that works later on. There's also a federal excise tax. Federal excise tax is 18.4 cents a gallon. It does not directly tie to federal revenues that come back to the state for transportation because the feds have the very enviable position in, uh, of being able to spend whatever they want regardless of what they take in. That fund source is only enough to fund about two-thirds of what is spent on highway system. And finally, depending on what locality you're in, there are local sales taxes collected on gasoline. 
an average for the state would be about 10 cents per gallon um, or about 18 percent of all the taxes paid on gasoline. In certain uh, cities like Los Angeles, you would pay certainly a lot more. Other localities, you may pay less for sales tax. So in general, on a gallon of gasoline, you're paying as much as 60 cents per gallon in taxes uh, for various uses. So the base excise tax, and I'm going to take these individually. I'm going to talk about the base, and then I'm going to talk about the price-based excise tax later on. The base excise tax has in, been in place since 1923. It was two cents at the time. And there's only been uh, actions to increase that tax six times since 1923. So we're coming up on 95-ish uh, uh, years since that was first put into place. And there's only been six times that we've increased that tax. The last time was in 1991, where Proposition 111 was passed by the voters in California. It increased the excise tax to nine cents at the time. I'm sorry, uh, from nine cents to 14 cents, and then added one penny each year until 1994. And the tax rate has been at 18 cents a gallon since 1994. That's uh, 22 years now since 1994. And unfortunately, when we talk about excise taxes like this that have been flat for a long period of time, we have to talk about the impact of inflation to that rate. So any business costs increase over time with inflation, whether it's transportation projects, whether it's uh, your regular business, or the cost of goods, increases over time. Sometimes there's deflation, but generally speaking, you're looking at inflation over time. So this chart shows the impacts of that inflation on the excise taxes that have been in place since 1923. Along the bottom, you see these little green columns. Those are the tax rates that are the same as on the page before this. The green line that squiggles up and down is that same tax rate adjusted for inflation. So when we talk about the heyday of transportation construction when we were building these highways and doing these great things, that was in the 50s and 60s. <coughs> That's when the value of this tax was at its peak. So when you're looking at the squiggly line, you look at the 50s and 60s, you see the value of that excise tax rate was significantly greater than it is now. And again, this is the base excise tax as it is used for maintenance and rehab of our system and at the time was used for expansion. Since the 1970s when we had the uh, two oil embargoes and a lot of inflation, general inflation and also specific to the cost of oil and goods and services related to oil and asphalt, saw tremendous increases in inflation over that time really eroding the value of the taxes we were collecting. That line, uh, the squiggly line, again, the one that, that adjusts for inflation, never stops moving, but the tax has stopped moving since 1994. So that green line is now worth about half, the tax we collect is worth about half of what it was worth when we put it in place in 1994. We're only getting about half as much for our money as we used to. So that's one issue, and it's certainly a huge issue when we look at the value of the tax and what we can get for the money we're collecting. Another worry that we're looking at moving forward is the fact that we tax on a gallon of gasoline use. It's been a proxy for use of the highway system for many years, and when it was put in place, it made great sense. There were no alternatives. You drove your Model T. You used gas. Everybody used the same amount of gas. That's not the case anymore. Now, we have uh, CAFE standards that are requiring vehicles to get up to 55 miles a gallon as soon as the year 2030, 15 year, 14 years from now, 55 miles to the gallon. We have electric cars that don't use any fuel, don't pay any taxes to upkeep the roads. So when we look at what the future is going to bring, we're pretty concerned that the loss of revenue because of increased fuel efficiency or alternative fuels is going to outpace even what we've seen the impact from inflation. So as we move forward, we might see increases in VMT growth, as is shown in this line, the blue line, increases in use of the highway and local roads, but decreases in fuel consumption, which directly correlates to a decrease in the revenues that we use to upkeep these systems. Fun news so far? <laughs> this is why everybody always smiles when I walk into the room, because I have such good news all the time. Now I'm going to go uh, back and talk about the price-based excise tax, and I ask you to bear with me because this is a little bit complicated. Um, sales taxes have been collected in, on gasoline since 1971. 
And in 2010, for political reasons that I will only explain under extreme duress, <laughs> the sales tax on gasoline was eliminated and replaced with what we call a price-based excise tax. So under a sales tax system, when you went to buy gasoline, you paid a tax based on the value of your purchase, which was directly related to the price of gasoline. The price-based excise tax attempts to do the same thing, but it is a per-gallon tax instead. So what this fuel tax swap did is it made the Board of Equalization responsible for setting a sales to I'm sorry, for setting an excise tax rate every year that would roughly equal the amount of money that was <coughs> collected when it was a sales tax. It also requires the Board of Equalization to make uh, adjustments annually to make sure it was the same and to, if you over collected or under collected in a prior year to make sure that the new rate reflects that so that you're never collecting more or less than you would have under the old system. Part of the reason that was done was to allow um, access to a new source of funds for general fund relief. And that is part two of what occurred in 2010 that we call the weight fee swap. So there were two swaps that occurred in that year. They got rid of the sales tax, put into a place, a price-based excise tax. At the same time, they took commercial vehicle weight fees, which currently go into the state highway account for maintenance and rehabilitation of the state highway system. Took that and used it to pay debt service on Proposition 1B bonds. Those are the bonds that we've all been enjoying spending over the last uh, 10 years. Now that is paid for by uh, fees that would have otherwise gone to uh, improvement uh, of the state highway system. So what they've done is they've said this new price based excise tax that we put in place, the very first call on those new revenues is to backfill the money that we're taking for weight fees and putting towards debt service. And the reason that's important is because of how the money is split. So the price-based excise tax, the very first call on that revenue is to pay that debt service on transportation bonds. It's about a billion dollars a year. Specifically, it's to backfill the weight fees, which pay for the bonds, but it's really the same thing. The remaining money is split 44% directly to local streets and roads. So this goes to counties and cities across the state. 44% of the remaining revenue goes into the STIP, which in turn goes 75% to local agencies, and 12% remains in the state highway account for rehabilitation of the state highway system. But all of that occurs after the first chunk of money goes to pay for debt service on bonds. So you end up with something that looks like this, and this is a four, well, three-year history plus one year of projection of this price-based excise tax that I've talked about. In 2013-14, uh, the price-based excise tax set by the Board of Equalization was 21 and a half cents. About a third of that went to pay debt service and the rest was split 44-44-12. It was a good year. In 2014-15, the, the price-based excise tax rate was decreased to 18 cents a gallon. But as I like to describe this, the, the amount that it goes to debt service is like the guy who comes to your house and always eats a pound of pie every time he comes over. Doesn't matter how big a pie you made, he always eats that pound. So in 1415, the excise tax rate was 18. The pound of pie still goes away. At this point now, you're looking at more like 40% of the pie is going to debt service. The amount that goes to everything else shrinks. In the current year, 1516, the excise tax rate set by the Board of Equalization is 12 cents. So we've gone from 21 to 18 to 12. All of the impact of that is focused on the STIP, local streets and roads, and the shop. So now we're looking at almost two-thirds going towards debt service, the rest shrinking again. As we look towards the future, we think the Board of Equalization is likely to choose a rate for next fiscal year as low as 10 cents or possibly even lower. And if they did that, the amount that goes to debt service is three quarters of the pie. And the amount left over for the STIP and for local streets and roads is about $150 million each, statewide for everybody. So when I presented uh, this information to the commission in December, this would be the California Transportation Commission, 
they asked for us to go back and look at the revenue assumptions behind the STIP fund estimate. This is the fund estimate that sets the funding level for the STIP for a five-year period. When we did that, we came back to the Commission actually yesterday after consulting with Commission staff for several weeks on what different scenarios we might look at for price-based excise taxes. And what's driving this lower rate year after year after year, or at least for the last three years, is low gas prices. And right now, they're as low as we've seen in a long time, and all reports look to be uh, that it will stay low for quite some time. So the Commission had to address this drop in revenue in their estimates because they're required to have a reasonable estimate of, of funding, not just for state law, but for also federal law. If we don't constrain what we're doing to the funding available, the feds do what they call decertify the FTIP. They'll say, your funding assumptions are crazy. We don't think you can actually do that. We're going to decertify it, and you get no federal funds. So we had to, well, not we, but the commission had to take this step of adjusting revenues. Um, we had a very robust discussion yesterday. I spent at least an hour in front of the commission talking about just this one assumption for their revised fund estimate yesterday. And some commissioners asked for new scenarios. The one that we brought forward to them yesterday with our recommendation was uh, the one that they ultimately adopted today that cut revenue $800 million. Yesterday, some commissioners called for what they uh, said were more realistic estimates, assuming that the price stayed as low as it is for, more, for three years or four or five years. One scenario uh, that was requested by uh, one of the commissioners uh, actually ended up cutting the entire step completely for five years. There would have been no step under a scenario uh, where the gas uh, tax rate stays at 10 cents for five years. I didn't bring all this with me because this was just this morning. I gave uh, a final presentation this morning, hopped in my car and drove down here. But the result is, as Joe uh, had already presented, the result is this morning the Commission adopted the new revenue estimates and adopted a new fund estimate that cuts $750 million in program, I'm sorry, it cuts $800 million in program capacity from the STIP. And since the STIP is already at about $50 million total capacity, it, it puts us in a situation where we have to deprogram $750 million. That was a long road to get here, but I think it's important to understand the different taxes we pay and how they fund different types of projects so that we can see, pardon me, so that we can see why we end up in this situation where the funding available for the STIP projects sort of uh, evaporated on us because it is based on the price of gas. So uh, I'm going to very briefly talk about what we're doing about the general picture. Uh, it's not my intention to go through any of the proposals that are out there. My understanding is you have got somebody else to do that for you. But um, the three major proposals that are out there, the governor's, Senator Bell's, and Assemblyman Frazier's uh, proposal, all would uh, eliminate this annual adjustment of the price-based excise tax rate and fix it at some rate pretty close to 18 cents. So that you wouldn't see this wild swing in revenue and you wouldn't see um, you know, the commission adopting these new revenue changes that, that dramatically impact all of the work that we're doing on the step. Um, and finally, when we talk about the impact of these new kinds of cars coming on the road that don't use as much gas or that might use uh, electricity, um, we're, you know, we're also looking into a, uh, a pilot program that was required by SB 1077 that requires the CTC, uh, Caltrans, and our transportation agency to look at what they call a road charge, which would be a, based on the miles driven on and off the highway system rather than on the gallons of gas used. Uh, and uh, this slide here kind of explains what that is. It's really uh, looking at whether it's even feasible to go and charge people for use of the highway system in the same way that a utility company charges for your use of water or your use of electricity. It is a utility. It's a public utility. It's not one that people think of as a utility, and it's one that we certainly all take for granted, but it is a utility. So this, again, it's a pilot program. We're not doing anything crazy with, with new taxation. This is a pilot program to see if it's even possible to put in uh, a user pay system like this. 
Um, at the bottom of this page is a fairly easy to remember web link, CaliforniaRoadChargePilot.com. It's a pretty snazzy website. It explains all the work that's been done for the last year from a very, very in-depth technical advisory committee um, that brought forth all the policy considerations that an actual pilot needs to look at for the next year. It's got a lot of great information I encourage people to look at. It's also asking for volunteers to sign up for the pilot. We need people who are for this and we need people who are not for this. We need people in rural counties, we need people in cities, north, south. We need a huge volunteer pool so that we can adequately study whether this is even a feasible thing to do. From a taxation standpoint, this is kind of an expensive way to go around collecting taxes and it's extremely invasive. But it's also the best way to directly link the taxes you pay to your use of something. So there's pros and there's cons and there are big pros and cons. I'm not gonna advocate for either one, but I do encourage everybody to go to that link, read about it, maybe volunteer. It's gonna be rather interesting as we go forward. And uh, I have to uh, just say, I'm required to say that at every presentation I do by my boss. So if she asks, please tell her that I, I made the, the push for, for volunteers. Uh, that's the entire presentation in a nutshell. I'm sure there are questions and I'll be happy to talk about anything. And if there's no questions, then I did a really good job. Yeah. You did a fabulous job. So, so the question is, how do other states with lower gas prices fund, fund their infrastructure needs? And I'll say that in most every state, uh, the way that they fund is based on excise taxes the same way that we do. So you pay by the gallon. Arizona actually, I believe, has a higher base excise tax rate for those kinds of things than we do. So they pay by the gallon, not based on price at all. Uh, also, Arizona is a compact square state, which is the best kind of state to have when you want to fund infrastructure projects. A long, skinny state is the worst kind of state to have when you want to fund infrastructure projects because you need to have huge, long backbones and then spurs coming off instead of nice little grid patterns for your freeways. So we have some geographical challenges as well as uh, obvious price challenges. Uh, I'm looking at the cost of the, the 50 cents, uh, the 80 cents difference in our fuel costs. I was wondering how they're able to. Oh, why know. it is that we have such higher prices? Yeah. You, you, sure. I know it's, we have oil refinery to oil and everything in right. Arizona. That's just an example. Arizona's an example. There's other states much cheaper. In fact, we're one of the highest costs on fuel than Hawaii and uh, mm -hmm. one other state. Yeah. And how they're able to do it. And here we have all the oil and refineries and uh, everything here. But but we're still taxed quite a bit more on our fuel, but I can, we can go to other states and, and a, whole, a whole lot less cost for their fuel, but yet their roads are seem pretty decent and everything, and uh, how, are they how are they able to manage that, and we can't seem to, you know, get right. our roads fixed up with the, you know, what we bring in. Right, so I, you know, I can't answer to everything, but I can say that it is difficult to fund a structure like California's where we have uh, very concentrated urban areas spread far apart, and we are a very large state with a lot of roads. I think if you look at the per capita uh, spending on roads, we're about the same. We're not, we're, we, if we look at per capita spending and per mile driven spending in California, we're about the same. We're in the middle of the pack of all the, all the states. So it's not that you know, we collect more or they collect more or they spend more or we spend more. It's that we have a lot to take care of. There's a huge infrastructure that we're taking care of. So when you look at how we spend versus everyone else, we're in the middle of the pack. Uh, as you look at the population, there are 33 million or so in California is driving plus visitors, right. and Arizona is what, three or four million. Right, lots of wear and tear on the roads from all those people traveling around in California. But a lot of gas being consumed. Mm -hmm. But on another question I have, may be a little bit different, but um, the carb tax and everything involved that, on these, that we get from these uh, cars that run off of electric combination fuel. Um, should we get them back? Be, should they be finding some of the roads that uh, they're driving on, uh, come back from the sales of carbon tax or something? 
the California put back into the roads instead of going ahead and buying forests or other things? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, I, I would say that one of the benefits of the road charge that, that we're tasked with doing a pilot on is that it does charge each user according to the use of the system. So you don't have that disparity between somebody who might drive a Prius or a Tesla who pays nothing to upkeep the highway system. And those of us who drive gasoline powered cars who pay all the money to upkeep the system. So uh, should they pay? Yes. Everybody should pay their fair share of the system that they use. How that is implemented, that's up to the legislature to, to figure out how they want to do that. Supervisor Scrivener. Oh, did you have any more, Orchel? I'm sorry. Um, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, Supervisor Thank, Scrivener. thank you, Madam Chair. This isn't a new problem. Back in 2005, Congressman Thomas appointed me to the National Service Transportation Infrastructure Finance Commission, which is part of the 2005 Safety Lube Bill, and we studied uh, vehicle miles, price, uh, price base um, for, for road financing, um, a lot of things. It's just it's been a failure of leadership on you know the behalf of the state legislature. And it's gotten gotten us to this problem that uh, we've you know we've known about for many many years. It certainly is an ongoing problem, and it's not going away. It's getting worse. Does anyone from the public or anyone else up here have, I any have a question? If I may, yes, sir. Um, where uh, we at on the um, bridges? You know, to improve the bridges, there I can see there's very very deteriorated. Um, uh, pretty much everywhere. So that's a, a question that I don't have an answer to. That's uh, I'm the money guy. So when it comes to the performance of the bridges, I can say that um, they are a high priority for the state. I can't tell you what their condition is versus any other state or, or where they should be. Uh, I, I just don't have those numbers. Uh, I can forward along information that would help answer that question. Yeah, for funding, uh, but I can't do it right now. On funding for for that area. Uh, well, funding for the area is, is a shortfall. So when we talk about the $57 billion shortfall uh, for highway maintenance, that includes uh, everything, uh, especially bridges and overcrossings. There's uh, something on the order of 12,000 of them owned by the state, uh, overcrossing and bridges that, that need repair and constant maintenance. Um, there's not enough funding for that, uh, but it's included in the total. I don't have a specific number for you. I, I know the resource that can give you that number, and I'll be happy to forward that along to staff to give to you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Mr. Uh, thank you very much. Certainly, absolutely. Mr. Smalley. Yes, Madam Chair, very quickly, just wanted to clarify uh, that this item is for information. We had a little bit of a hiccup in the agenda. We did correct it on okay. the uh, version on the website, but just to make sure you all know um, this is an information item this evening. I okay. understand. And then I understand that uh, uh, Congressman Thomas would like to say a few words. I suppose perhaps he might. <laughs> Then please join us. You're up, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Zach is absolutely correct. Uh, this is a problem that no one has faced up to, uh, but it's gotten significantly worse. Uh, the idea that everybody's driving a gasoline car, consuming and paying user fees at the pump to build highways is a kind of a classic user pay model. The problem is the federal government began telling manufacturers what kind of cars they can build and what performance they have to achieve. Also technology began taking over using something other than gasoline. A 1958 Chevy parked in your driveway with the key off emitted more pollution than the car you're going to drive home tonight going 60 miles an hour on the road. We have made significant strides. Also, one of the keys to getting better mileage, which is the focus of what the federal government has said manufacturers have to do, is Weight uses more. So you make a lighter vehicle. 
The problem is the trucks that more and more use the highways are getting bigger and larger, double trailers in many states, so that that weight is also destroying the roads faster than the cars are. You get into a big argument about who pays their fair share. Uh, that's not the problem anymore. The state of California found out they couldn't, and I'll try to use positive terms, steal um, <laughs> money from the gas fund to use for other purposes if they kept the same tax structure. So they've changed the tax structure to this excise tax approach. The problem is when people try to figure out a way to get more money, they don't concentrate on the mechanism um, and the consequences of a failure to meet arbitrary estimated numbers in those models. And what the state has created is a one-year look back on money already allocated based upon the price of gasoline. Um, be honest with me. How many people honestly thought you could fill up for less than $2.50 a gallon three years ago, two years ago? Okay, so you've got a variable that completely destroys the model. They are allocating money, 2014, that they looked at on a prospective basis and paying it back on a retrospective basis. And so what you've got is going to be every year a sawtooth amount that may or may not be available because it was given the year before and paid for by adjusting the model the year after. We're in a position that we have money and we've uh, come together uh, better than anywhere else I know of in the United States uh, uh, to share what money we have available to build roads for us. Caltrans is well aware we're in a north-south state. We're in east-west county. So we have a couple of really good north-south roads, except we never got very much money to improve or expand those north-south roads because the state of California and the legislature of California distributes the money that comes from the federal government. We're a barbell state. We aren't the big weight in the south. We aren't the big weight in the north. We're the bar that connects the two weights, and we need significant east-west highways. The fair share pot that we have very positively allocated is now going to be retroactively, in my opinion, it's not technically that legally, money will be taken away from us that we said we had. Because the formula that determines how much they have to change the amount, they gave away too much. So we're going to have to generate reductions in our money because of the failure of this sawtooth formula. Uh, we, we used a lot um, a formula which tries to create a sawtooth and turning it into a wave where you can say let's take a five-year running average, drop the high, drop the low, average the three, and that would be what it would be over the five. That knocks off a lot of the valleys and peaks so that it's not quite a shock. The problem is we shifted the entire way we're funding because they can now utilize the money in terms of other things other than highways. So when you take this trend to lighter cars, heavier trucks, federally designated miles per gallon, and then the state shifting its formula, and we're not in a population area that can get money directed by the state. We have to look at what we were planning on doing, <coughs> tighten our belt. This is, I understand it, in the initial round, a voluntary give back. 
uh, don't kid yourself. If the target is 750 million, uh, who wants to go first? And it's not going to equal 750 million if people voluntarily give it up. And so there's going to be the use of some system. And unfortunately, Kern County is not one of the favored counties when they're going to use a system to determine who pays what, when, and how. By the way, that's my definition of politics. <laughs> and most of the people in the state are not happy with the way we were able once every 50 years to finally get some money to try to build highways. There is a mechanism in California for counties to help themselves. If we were to impose, uh, normally historically it's a sales tax that would be dedicated toward transportation, you then get identified as a self-help county. There are currently 19 and possibly going to be 20 soon who, if you put it this way, get to be in the front of the line when it's time to distribute the money. We are, at best, 20th in line. And, of course, there are a number of counties in Southern California and some in the Bay Area who are then going to turn to us, talk to their friends in the legislature and elsewhere, and say, excuse me, Kern County, you're first right after me because of the way in which we're viewed statewide for this brief moment of glory. So we have some very tough decisions to make. I have been very pleased with the argument that I made that this area can bring all of the governments and the finances associated with those governments, the federal, the state, the county, the city, and the city governments that make up the rest of a county, the COGS, and we can pool our resources and we will work cooperatively to build highways in our area. The only catch was that money had to come to our area because if it went to Sacramento, they would take 90 cents, give us 10 cents, give us dead-end freeways, give us freeways that as they came toward the population center actually lost lanes and then wound up uh, in a shopping center <laughs> along with some of the cars periodically. Uh, so therefore, no one will ever be able to do what we did. All of the money now goes to those other structures. At some point, you're going to see really inequitable decisions made on the part of all of us who came together as a group. Because when you're going out to look for 35 or 50 million in various projects, especially on new construction, you're going to pick one, two, or three. And in a county of our size, there may be two from Eastern Kern. Now, again, ironically, one of the major roads that was going to be focused on for being improved is a north-south highway called 395, which is the way most of the uh, L.A. population gets to Mammoth uh, in their Audis, Porsches, BMWs, Mercedes. Uh, and that money actually benefits them more than it benefits us. But there are other areas. On the west side of the county, you know how um, tough it's been with Highway 46. All of us know of someone or related to someone who's been involved in tragic accidents, and we've made major strides, and we're, we're just about ready to complete the system of two lanes going each direction, absolutely essential, on 46. We may, in fact, lose money for that project. And we may even be threatened with our core attempt to create freeways across the ninth largest city in California. And I'm going to be speaking more. I've spoken in not too many public places. But at some point, 
the citizens and voters of Kern County have to understand no one wants to help us and no one will help us if we don't help ourselves. We have got to become a self-help county. Then we're in the front 19 and they can't deny us various funds. We still have a, a long way to go to have an adequate transportation system in a very mixed use area. Of course population, of course normal uh, commerce, but farm to market roads, obviously dealing with our uh, primary extraction uh, of oil uh, and significant other activities. And what you heard is they're going to sit down and they're going to make voluntary cuts. And if the voluntary cuts don't equal the amount that's necessary, they will step in. At that point, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that I don't care what the weapon is and I don't care what the scope is, we're going to be in the crosshairs. And so we have got to prepare ourselves in a way that we stay together, we're unified, we go forward, and please don't make the mistake that if you're looking for savings in the short run, you go after investments in tomorrow. The idea that we're going to start eating up the money we have so carefully put together to build highways to pay for short-term uh, needs is going to do us in because this is our only opportunity uh, to do what we haven't been able to do for 50 years. This is a significant blow. Uh, there are ways to assess people in the use of our system that doesn't tie to gasoline power, even doesn't tie to weight. For a long time, Europe used to uh, tax their vehicles on the size of the propulsion unit. And you just got a, uh, a presentation earlier about how we can convert kilowatt hours and volts into uh, forms of power. Uh, and that's why uh, most cars have engines in them and not motors. More cars have motors in them than they used to, and that's electricity. But there is a way to equalize the burden of those if it's going to be a user fee. All get to pay their fair share. It's not coming out of the California legislature. It's not coming out of the administration. In the short term, it's going to be very hurtful as those peaks and valleys get drug across us every year with money that we thought was ours, then after the fact reduced. So I it was a little disturbed about this, and I've never really learned the lesson that if you say something, you're going to have to be responsible for addressing a larger group. So thank you once again, Aaron, for making me um, do this. Uh, but no one's going to help us if we don't help ourselves. Thank you very, very much. Yes, sir. A couple questions away. Um, Aaron, to what, to what extent have we been able to make the argument that the traffic impact fees that we have been imposed on new development should give us some credit when it comes to being, quote unquote, self-help? It's, it's not a sales tax that everybody pays, but nevertheless, it is something that we here in Kern County have to help pay for transportation that other counties don't. Great, great question. Uh, we. we we do have traffic impact fees in some of the communities. We, we don't have them in all communities and all cities in Kern County. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two is uh, traffic impact fees have to have an, a nexus. They can't go back and pay, the, uh, pay for the work that hasn't been done over the past four, five, six decades. So if you build 10 houses, you have to pay the impact fee that those Ten houses would have right. on the system. So th the short answer is this, the CTC and Caltrans only recognize counties that have a sales tax as self-help. Okay. Um, and if I may, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to ask Craig Pope, our Roads Commissioner, just to give everybody an idea of what 
the impact is going to be to Kern County's road system um, because of the developments with the gas tax. It's it's sub significant, and we're not quite sure yet how we're going to deal with it. So, Mr. Pope. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. We're just still working on it. Now we're taking a look at the numbers. We're very hard today in making a planned budget. We're basically scrapping our budget and starting over again. But it looks like uh, we're we're about 10 million short, and that's going to change our that equates to about 125 miles of road that aren't going to get surfaced this year that should be, and they, we're talking about a seal, a chip seal, a slurry seal, something like that, that would keep it from degrading to the point of needing to be reconstructed. So these aren't roads that we're, we'll, we won't be able to hold together. And if anything, we learned in the mid-90s, we went through this same concept. I, I was part of it at that time, is we cut to the bone and we stayed there for about five years. That hurt us. I mean, it took us till now. Just, we're just about caught up. The county went out and bonded $50 million for projects that helped us get there. We had enough money here lately. We just about got to where we were in the mid-90s when we started to have to make cuts. So it took about 20 years to recover from that. So if this thing holds on like it looks like it is, we'll be in the same boat. Thank you, Craig. Yes, thank you very much. Anyone uh, have any other questions? I know we're all concerned on how we're going to get this done, but thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, with the happy news, uh, we move to board members' meeting reports. There are none, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That you, I got confused. Uh, motion to receive and file the report. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. We have one more uh, uh, That's agenda right. item. That's true. Uh, that is item you're talking uh. about. Yeah, 7A. Yes. So, thank you, Chair, uh, Council Members. The uh, Kern COG participation in the Kern uh, um, for HMF Coalition is uh, before you. This is an action item to request some direction to staff as well as for the Chair to sign a letter. Uh, the um, uh, Let's see, last Thursday, Kern Cog staff received a request for Kern to sign a coalition letter supporting the siting of the uh, high-speed train HMF in Kern. The HMF stands for Heavy Maintenance Facility. Uh, this is the control center for, the, um, uh, for, for that uh, new proposed facility. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, we were requested uh, for staff to support the effort uh, of this uh, Kern for HMF group. Uh, the, um, uh, the HMF has the potential for 1,500 permanent jobs and over $25 million per year in tax revenue for the region. Uh, Kern has three HMF sites under consideration by the High Speed Rail Authority. One is in Wasco and two are in Shafter. The uh, group uh, has uh, strong evidence that Kern sites are by far the best sites in the state based on technical merit, but that other sites uh, that are more proactive uh, in their marketing uh, could be selected. Uh, the action that's before you is to authorize the chair to sign the letter of support for citing the HMF in Kern, uh, direct a staff to assist the Kern for HMF coalition in winning uh, the HMF for Kern and authorizing uh, Kern Cog's uh, logo to be included on the Kern for HMF website uh, and letterhead. And we'd be happy to answer any questions related to this item. Thank you, sir. Any questions and concerns? Yes, sir. Forget about this. Uh, what's the odds of the high speed rail come into reality? Well, first, I know it's a cost of us to, to try to get the bid in order to the advertising or lobbyists go there and try to have them come to Kern or, yeah. or the cost involved? Uh, this action has no cost involved to be using existing staff level resources uh, that are already uh, geared at monitoring the uh, high speed rail project. Thank you. I, I just I'd like to say I mean, you know a lot of us have probably a lot of opinions as far as high speed rail is concerned its viability whether we're whether or not we'll see it constructed but I think the effort to try and 
land the heavy maintenance facility for Kern County is something that we all should be able to get behind the, the jobs that it will provide to us to our region and there there also may be some uses for the heavy maintenance facility if it's constructed whether or not high-speed rail comes to fruition as far as it's envisioned um, or not um, as far as existing rail infrastructure and things like that so I, I think this is something we should all get behind and support thank you sir any other comments oh yes ma'am Here we go. Yes, it's most important because all the cities will benefit if this does come about, and I believe that's what your question is. If the high speed rail does materialize and comes this way, there's no reason that they shouldn't consider this area for a maintenance station. Heavy maintenance would bring in a great deal of change for the economics. We can't just depend on agriculture as well as oil today. It's really important that we take advantage of the jobs and the technology that's going to be involved in this project. So to have the support of all the cities and just to fast track before it has to go to the high speed rail authority, it is most important that we do that at this time. And this is one way to get the backing with all the cities. Yes, sir. What, what is the exact uh, uh, estimated time frame of the decision at this point I know it keeps floating out there are a couple of milestones that were reported last uh, week to the high-speed rail authority board uh, the first one is possible presentation of a selection criteria at the next high-speed rail authority board in February I think mm -hmm. it's about February 11th then uh, by April, the end of April, there would be a release of an analysis that would have a preferred HMF location that would be incorporated into an environmental document that would go out for public review and that environmental document is scheduled to be completed by September. Anyone else have any comments, questions, concerns? Okay, um, <laughs> yes, sir. The final decision would uh, not occur till after December, uh, after September, that's correct. So the purpose, as I understand, of this letter is to get Kern Cog more involved in this. Um, at this time, it, it, there's not really going to be any decision for some period of time, am I correct? In understanding that? I, yes, I wouldn't characterize it as more involved, just to show that we support a heavy maintenance okay. facility okay. in Kern County. Not that we support high speed rail. We're just okay. talking about the heavy That's maintenance right. facility only. Yeah. And we would not be weighing in at all about the Bakersfield alignment or the old alignment. Just the heavy maintenance facility. Okay, understood. I think um well we'll 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 see very shortly. Uh, I think that's a good idea. And I understand uh Supervisor Scrivener, your comments with regard to working our hardest to get some more jobs into this area. Okay, at this time, um, yes, we do. Um, I'll we make a motion on staff's recommendation. Second. I'll second. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so carried. Thank you very much. So now at this time, uh, we will move to the Caltrans report. Ms. Miller? Hi. Hi. Thank you. Well, we talked a lot about what's not going to happen. I can report on what is happening. Mm -hmm. So I've got uh, one, two, th four shop projects I want to report on. And the first one is uh, the Lost Hills Lane replacement that's located between Laredo over crossing and State Route 5, State Route 46 separation. It's a $40.3 million shop project. Um, the northbound traffic switch was put into place. Concrete removal and road excavation has been completed, as well as subgrade compaction. Scheduled work for upcoming weeks include placement of hot mix asphalt and compaction, the guardrail and drainage work, and there's medium uh, shoulder work um, continues. There are some um, nighttime closures um, while they place the K-rail or they remove the K-rail and do some more traffic switches, switching. Therefore, Interstate 5 will be reduced to one lane as permitted. Uh, this work is considered to be approximately 45% complete. 
the anticipated uh, final completion date is a year from now, so it'd be January 2017. Uh, we've got the Bakersfield Bridge Preventative Maintenance. That's on Route 204. That's um, the limits are the Golden State Avenue on Golden State Avenue between State Route 99 and State Route 178. That's in Kern County, um, and the project uh, a project is in winter suspension. Go figure. Uh, they're act they're anticipated to resume though in early spring, and at that time uh, there'll be some uh, scour there's some scour damage at various piers on the Kern River Bridge that need to be addressed. Um, this may require uh, some various permits and maybe some additional design work. Um, and they probably going to be limited as the time that they can get into the riverbed. Um, so that has to do with probably the environmental permits. And then we've got the Sunny Lane pedestrian overcrossing on State Route 78, 178. Um, and that's a shop project that is um, at 2.9 million. Contractors currently constructing uh, the curb ramps, uh, bridge fence, installing lights. Uh, the freeway may be closed, uh, but it'll be during the nighttime hours while they do um, light installation and some false work removal. That is 80% complete with the final completion um, actually around the corner, so March. Eastbound Sand Canyon um, on State Route 58, um, and that is a $2.4 million shop project. The bridge has been removed. Contractors working on columns and abutments. Eastbound and offbound ramps um, are closed and will remain closed until the project is complete, which should happen in June. And I know, um, Mayor Flores, you talked about the bridges. Our new mile marker is out. And you will find on pages four and five, it gives, you know, we have, obviously everybody knows about our new mission and vision, but we also have new goals. And one of the goal number two on page four is the stewardship and efficiency. And it talks about um, the bridge health index. And we had committed by 2020 uh, to, ha to maintain a 95 or better rating on our bridge health index and currently that we're trending up and we are meeting those goals so there's a lot of information on the health of our um, assets in this and plus a lot of other good information so this is our I call it our report card so take some time to, to read through and but, but you always know if you have questions you can call me yeah so thank you appreciate it oh you're welcome so if there's not any other questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, moving on to the executive director's report, Mr. Hakimi. Good evening, Madam Chairman and board members. I'll start with some good news. I've been telling you for the last year and a half that the federal transportation bill, uh, we needed a new one. <laughs> President Obama signed the FAST Act. In December, uh, there's about a 10-page uh, PowerPoint presentation in your folders. We now have federal funding guaranteed for the next five fiscal years. So thank you to all of you that helped uh, us get there. Many of you uh, with me visited Washington, D.C. over the past several years. And uh, finally, uh, we have federal long-term federal legislation. Good news for, for all of us. Uh, earlier this morning, the CTC, that's the California Transportation Commission, approved uh, Kern's bike path extension project, Kern Counties, from roughly Route 43 to Lake uh, Bu Buena Vista. Good news. They also approved two Tehachapi projects and two Kern projects. The two <coughs> Kern County projects for construction are the Highland Elementary Pedestrian Improvement Project and the Stern Middle School Pedestrian Improvement Project both for construction. The Tachapi projects are the Valley Boulevard Bicycle Facilities Project for $1.1 million and the Safe Routes to School Project for right-of-way <coughs> acquisition. Also, for those of you that travel in Metropolitan Bakersfield, both in the incorporated and unincorporated areas, you may have seen uh, some improvements around GET bus stops. Those. Uh, Projects are being funded mostly by GET 
transit funds, uh, and we've been getting nothing but positive comments about those. We're putting in new wheelchair ramps, curbs and gutters, and access to the buses. Congratulations to Golden Empire Transit, uh, the County of Kern, and the City of Bakersfield, who have partnered together to make improvements around the bus stops. <laughs> That's all I have on this agenda. Subject to your questions, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for to get for that extra funding, too. To um, I'd like to, I, if anyone else doesn't have anything to say, I'd like to, uh, you have some comments? Yes, sir. If, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. No, please. I'm talking way more than I usually do, but I, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Hakimi and his staff. Um, Mayor Wood and I have been working with uh, Caltrans. Uh, did I take, am I stealing your thunder? Go for it. You're doing great. Okay. Well, I hope, I'm, I'm sorry no, if you were going to talk about this, but Mayor Wood and I, we've been working with uh, Aaron, his staff, and also uh, Craig Pope to try and find a solution for the California City Boulevard connection to the Edwards Air Force Base uh, interchange on Highway 58. If any of you are familiar with Eastern Kern, the folks that live in Cal City that work at Edwards have to take a left turn across four lanes of highway. Um, so if you wanted to try and jet across 58, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, lead down here and they have to stop in the median and then and then uh, get into traffic and so there is a defense access road program that uh, Aaron identified and we've met with the with the general general Schaefer and his staff on a couple of occasions and Aaron I know you just met on the 19th with them and so what Aaron did with his staff is they put together the application to help the Air Force to submit um, this up, up the chain of command. And I know Scott's here from Edwards. And so this has been a group effort. But I, Aaron, thank you for taking the initiative. And uh, we greatly appreciate it. And hopefully we'll, we'll hear some good news soon. My pleasure. I'll piggyback on that. Thank you very much. I'm glad you jumped right. in. You went to a far, far more detail. I was just really impressed um, with the reports that I got back from the meeting from Edwards uh, this week that they were just, they had a package that was almost ready to go. And I understand we have to make some adjustments to that and we'll be working with Edwards and we really appreciate your support from day one through this. It's a win-win for that area uh, and for the future. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, anyone else have any comments either way? Okay, uh, at this time I'll call for an adjournment of this meeting and for our ability to move directly into the Kern Cog meeting. All right, we do, don't have to do another roll call at this point. Everyone's here. Um, the Kern Council Government's meeting on uh, January 21st, uh, 2016 continues with um, roll call. Well, no, you don't have to do roll call. I'm sorry, I got a little confused there again. All right, we're gonna go into public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of this council. Council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a brief referral um, to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the council at a later date. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar. <coughs> consent calendar, opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public which wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired, by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the, the council concerning the item before action is taken. At this time, is there any, are there any questions from the public or folks up here about that? Okay. Motion to approve consent. A second. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Morris. Yes. Boxer. Yes. Edward. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Um, item four, state transportation funding proposal comparisons. Mr. Phipps. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, to alleviate some of the gloom and doom, I'm here to assure you that the state legislature has your back. Um, <laughs> we have uh, we have no fewer than about six different uh, funding proposals 
to address many of the concerns that uh, you've heard tonight. Um, I, I'm not going to go through each one of them. Uh, they are spelled out in the, um, in the uh, staff report, but suffice to say that each one of them shares uh, the, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Keck suggested, uh, the common trait of uh, moving uh, weight truck fees back into transportation funding as opposed to going into debt service. The main difference between the Democratic proposals and the Republican proposals are taxes. And so, uh, you know, with uh, on the low end, you have the governor's proposal, which uh, would uh, bring in an additional three point six billion uh, from a variety of different sources, including a uh, diesel and gas tax increase, uh, vehicle license fee increase. Um, and the the proposals uh, go up from there in terms of the amount of revenue that they would generate. Uh, and of course, um, that it means uh, higher taxes or fees culminating with the most recent um, proposal from uh, Transportation uh, Assembly Transportation Committee Chairman uh, Jim Frazier uh, that would raise uh, uh, approximately $8 billion uh, with a 22 and a half cent increase in uh, the excise tax and uh, 30 cents per gallon on diesel fuel, uh, in addition to $165 vehicle surcharge and so forth. So um, a variety of proposals out there. The reason that we bring this to you tonight is just to, to uh, let you know what is on the horizon. Um, some of these proposals have been uh, uh, in front of the legislature since uh, spring of 2015. Um, the other thing they all share in common is that none of them have passed. And so, uh, you know, we want to, uh, but we do want to make you aware of the different proposals that are out there. We're not asking for any action tonight, but to be aware that we may come back at some point with a recommendation, uh, you know, seeking your approval to support uh, possibly a hybrid uh, or a variety of different options as are kind of explained in the staff report. And uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions or comments. Thank you very much for that bright and cheery report. Uh, anyone have any questions from the public or staff? Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Appreciate that, sir. Uh, so we move down um, to the executive director's report because there's nothing in between. Good evening again, Madam Chairman and board members. I have about a half dozen items, short items. Uh, tomorrow is the San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council special meeting on water. Um, Council Member Wegman uh, will be attending, and if anyone else is interested in attending, you can attend by phone. Uh, the topic is uh, just water, I believe. February 13th is Wh Whiskey Flat Days in Kernville. February 29th is CSUB Career Day. March 2nd is the San Joaquin Valley Policy Council Valley Voice Trip to Sacramento. If any of you would like to attend, please let me know. March 2nd and it will be just a one-day trip uh, there and back same day or go up the day before if you would like. March 3rd is the Regional Awards of Merit Ceremony at Seven Oaks Country Club. Price is $45 per person. Please get your RSVPs into Lori. We've already had about, mm, about 30, uh, 30 responses. It's very early though. March 3rd, Regional Awards of Merit again at Seven Oaks. March 31st to April 1st is the CalCog Regional Issues Forum in Monterey. Please let me or Lori know if you would like to attend. Uh, subject to your questions, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone have any questions? Looking both ways. Okay, at this time we'll move to member statements. On their own initiative, council members may make a brief announcement or a brief report on their own activities. In addition, council members may ask a staff for question, um, ask a question of staff or the public for clarification on any matter. Provide a reference to staff or other resources for factual information or request staff to report back to the council at a later meeting concerning any matter. Furthermore, the council any or, or any other matter member thereof may take action to direct staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. Do we have any member statements? Madam Chair, if I could just go over what was in your folder. I forgot to do that. Yes, sir. So in, in your folder this evening, it's thicker oh, than sorry. usual, is uh, what projects are at risk from the stip being cut. 
the letters from the individual cities and the county re responding to how they will deliver their federally funded projects by the end of this fiscal year, the Kern Cog quarterly newsletter, a copy of uh, Mr. Keck's presentation, our outreach efforts, schedule of cast disbursements for November and December, the present the summary of the new federal fast act that i went over timeline that covers january to may an article uh, written by senator gene fuller which is which addresses uh, the need to address transportation in part progress support for all the uh, transportation projects in the valley uh, unfortunately a um, obituary for Mr. Stephen Starbuck, who has uh, addressed his board in the past. He was the uh, accountant for the firm that we use to do our audits. The Caltrans update. The 2015 highlights from the California Transportation Commission. The um, Thomas Rhodes Improvement Status Report. And a copy of the electric bus presentation from Proterra. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize, Aaron, for oh. rushing right on over you. Uh, just mowing forward, as they say. Uh, however, in Mr. Keck's presentation, the, the presentation materials that we received are a little difficult. Is it possible for you to email that particular presentation out to us? I will have it emailed to all of you, and we will also post it on our website. Oh, that would be very good information to have out there, actually, so mo more people can see that. Now moving on to member statements. and. Uh, anything I said prior? Anyone else have anything? Okay, at this time we do uh, have to move into closed session. We have a closed session item conference with legal counsel on existing litigation. Government Code Section 54956.9. And the case name is Concerned Citizens About Centennial Corridor versus California Department of Transportation. So at this time I would ask for non members to. I haven't signed it. I'm going to sign it now. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, there's nothing to report out of closed session. So at this time, I would re request a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The next meeting will be held February 18, 2016. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>